Safha is an Arabic word that means salt flat. It's actually been introduced into the English dictionary. If you look up Sabha in the English dictionary, it will mean salt flat. And Sabhas constitute 5% of the UAE geography or landscape, and they fall under the category of wetlands. These are living environments that you find mostly along the coast of the UAE. The UAE is home to some of the most intact Sabhas in the world. They're also very old. This sabha we're standing on is probably 300 to 400 years old. A sabha is a living environment. Every time we come out to this site, it's different. And these are always also changing within the landscape. A sabha cannot be defined with a very clear geographic border. The border is always shifting. It's related to water and water is always moving. It's a fluid element. Sometimes it's flooded with more water, sometimes it's drier. It keeps changing. A sabha is composed of five different layers. One of the layers is a microbial mat. Once you look closer here, you can see the algae growing within it. Also within this microbial mat, you have many living organisms. So they're living environments with a lot of species living in them, really tiny kinds of different species, which I'm really interested to know more about. So this is part of our research is also talking with these environmental agencies to help us understand more and, you know, dig deeper into what sabhas are, what's the life in sabhas. Sabhas can sequester CO2. They are carbon sinks, just like our oceans and seas. So we should preserve them. They provide balance to our environment. What's interesting to note is that sabhas are great grounds for the mangroves because mangroves eat salt, so they live on salt. So the sabha sites are also, although they have the connotation of, you know, no vegetation. In fact, if you grow certain types of mangroves, they would flourish in sabhas. Then you can create this microclimate where, you know, the, the mangrove will also bring in birds and this and that, and then you have a microclimate going on. One of the aims in our research is to help preserve sabhas and help promote their conservation. What we are doing is analyzing the crystallization process in sabhas and learning from that, and learning from the minerals present in sabhas. Snow in the desert. That has taught us much in our research and experiments with the residual brine of desalination water. In this desert environment, there is no fresh water except uh, desal water and the UAE is the third largest desalinator in the world. The number one is KSA, number two is USA and the amount of reject brine that is produced by the desalination process is equivalent to 4,800 Olympic sized swimming pools daily that are being dumped into the Arabian Gulf. You're having this highly saline reject brine material that's daily being thrown back into the sea. So what's happening is that the life in the Gulf is dying and the Gulf is becoming this large battery because what's a battery? It's salt and water, so it's a large battery that stores energy. It's also adding to climate change and the rising of temperatures in the region. So there's a lot that goes with this industrial process. And that actually has a lot of problems that we are addressing in this project and in this exhibition. To access the desalination plants, you need road infrastructure, you know. So you have roads, networks that start to cut into the sabhas, and also you need to get power to these desalination plants. So you have these huge power grids that are going in, and then you start excavating in the sabhas to create the footings for these huge things. So there's this struggle. The struggle between nature and infrastructure, between nature and modernity, in order to build you need this infrastructure. And they are actually occupying most of the sabha size along the coastal front. Here you can see the power grid above me and the, the natural spa below me and the tension between the natural and the modern. So our interest in this research is really trying to see if this reject brine could be used as an architectural material you know, concrete is actually formed from minerals. So it's kind of the same line of thinking. We have this highly rich mineral solution. Could this rich mineral solution become an architecture? 
The first experiment was a very basic and innocent experiment. So we had the reject brine. And then what we did was try to see how we can grow crystals because crystals create structures and that will produce architecture. We simply started by submerging fabrics into the highly saline reject brine solution. And these fabrics will crystallize with time. And this creates different structures of different forms. The problem of these experiments is that we soon realized these are soluble structures. These are not insoluble structures, which means that they absorb humidity. And if it rains, they will collapse. There's a beauty in that, that they go back to nature. But at the end of the day, our intent is to produce a material that's a true contender to Portland cement, knowing that Portland cement is an environmentally disastrous material. It's responsible for 8% of global CO2 emissions. The problem of Portland cement is uh, the conversion of limestone, which is CaCO3, to CaO. To produce one ton of cement, you emit one ton of CO2. And to absorb one ton of CO2, you need one tree for 40 years to absorb that. So the material itself is extremely eco-unfriendly. We really wanted to try to push our research further. We wanted to move the experiments from innocent structures being created in an architectural office to real research in creating an alternative to Portland cement. What we did is we partnered up with NYU Abu Dhabi Amber Lab, which is an advanced material research laboratories. And what they could do is that they um, were able to extract MGO, which is a salt or a mineral found in the reject front and use that as a replacement to CAO, which is the problem of uh, the CO2 emission in Portland cement. And we were able to produce these insoluble blocks. It is a great material, but still the research is too early. The beauty of this material is that it absorbs CO2, but there's not enough CO2 in the atmosphere today for it to gain its strength. This material, we are able to produce it only as precast structures. Once we produced you know, this MGO cement block, we wanted to also experiment with not only a structural material, but also with finishes and different uh, materials that can be used uh, as applications to wall finishes, floor finishes, etc. It brings back the locality or the place into the building itself, where you know, I think Portland cement at some point became so universal and so, so standardized that the sense of locality or geography kind of completely di disappeared from architecture. It's kind of very much talking about the locality of the UAE and its geography and its landscapes. And that is an ode to, you know, looking back again into the UAE uh, ground and earth. And these are all the soils gathered from different parts within the UAE. Today, I'm very confident we can build a house of two story from precast units and we can use MGO, this MGO cement in, in achieving that. It's not at all difficult. There is a lot to learn from our precedents and that was important for us to learn. We went back and tried to see if anyone had actually built architecture out of sabkhas and tried to study the vernacular, if it was ever a vernacular material. Then we found out that a town on the border of Libya and Egypt called Siwa was built out from sabkha bricks. It's a very simple process. So what they found in nature, in their environment, were crystal blocks of sabkhas. So what they did is layered these blocks on top of one another and used the sabkha mud as the binder. So they would crystallize all together and become a rigid structure. Uh, still some hotels there operating are built from sabkha blocks and uh, quite healthy because, you know, salt is a very good material for asthma and anything related to, I think, lungs and, and it purifies the air. So. In a way, it's promoted as a healthy spa environment. In that aspect, you know, there's a lot to learn always from our ancestors and from vernacular architecture and makes us re-question our modern ways of building. It's these industries that just become too imposing on the market, on the developers, on the architects. And we need to reset and re-question and answer the question that Hashem Sarkis raised for the Biennale, 
how will we live together? And the we in this exhibition is purely us as humans and the planet or the environment. And this is how can we coexist? And we can coexist by trying to help our planet rather than deplete its resources and create emissions and all these environmental impacts. For Venice, actually, we are interested in uh, going back to our previous experiments with the different minerals and sands that we found in the UAE and uh, trying to actually achieve a crystal growth as a final finish to the prototype. Again, it will be a living structure similar to the Sabha, a living environment. So it will probably grow crystals with time or degrade and just collapse. That depends on the weather and the humidity. So it's going to be interesting to see the reaction of the structure with the actual environment in Venice. We're building a prototype using the MGO cements. These are soil molds that we are using to cast the modules that will build the prototype in Venice. You know, as I said earlier, we need to go back to vernacular in a way to re-question our way moving forward to create something that is more in tune and in harmony with nature and the earth. It's an antithesis kind of approach to modern architecture. So uh, we're using these soil uh, uh, say, uh, pods, in which we uh, draw the forms or the modules in which we cast then the MGO cement to uh, create the interlocking modules that will create the final structure in Venice. The shapes are inspired from the uh, coral houses, the vernacular architecture of the UAE. So each person's understanding of what a coral looks like would be drawn into the sand, into the soil actually, and then these are cast into them. We've built so many prototypes that we've kind of, it's a learning exercise of, you know, which interlock with which in a better way, what's the best scale. The outcome of the architecture is always different depending on the person. It's a communal approach. It's a way of going back and re-questioning our systems and what, you know, the modern way or the modern architecture, where has it taken us and do we need to change? And if not, okay, what will constitute the 21st century architecture? It's a huge question. We are obliged to answer and we as architects are responsible to answer.